Hogwarts is magical, beautiful, and full of secrets. Best remembered for its hidden corridors, firelit common rooms, great feasts, and lavish Christmases, it is the place we all hoped to visit when we were little. Many of us dreamed of receiving a Hogwarts acceptance letter. When we were 11, even knowing the Harry Potter books were just stories, we felt a slight disappointment when the letter didn't show up. Hogwarts has Quidditch, it has eccentric teachers and fascinating classes, and it has its four houses, which fans are eager to explore. The amount of excitement many experienced over seeing a Hufflepuff common room in the trailer for a Harry Potter video game, Hogwarts Legacy, says it all. However, Hogwarts is also unpredictable, dangerous, and even deadly. Voldemort's plots throughout the series didn't help the school's case, but there were plenty of instances where the school proved unreasonably dangerous even without his help. Fancy a trip to the Forbidden Forest? However wondrous Hogwarts is, it's a wonder more parents don't raise concerns. Whether it be rooms hiding terrible monsters, access to fatal substances, or forbidden areas you know teenagers are going to visit, Hogwarts has some seriously failing safety standards. Before we continue, I'm Riley and this is Otherworldly Fiction. On this channel I ramble about books sharing lore and discussing characters, as well as offer tips to fellow writers. If any of this sounds like your cup of pumpkin juice, hit that subscribe button. Posts are on Fridays. I wish to begin with a disclaimer. This video is not a criticism of the writing, or an ardent case for a more realistic school. It is meant to be a fun argument for why you might be relieved at your letter never arriving. Obviously, some suspension of disbelief is required in a fantasy series, and Hogwarts could have been dull as owl's droppings if it weren't as hazardous as it is. With that out of the way, what are the dangers to the school? Number one on this list is the Forbidden Forest. We have to start with the obvious. Reverse psychology is going to dictate that people, especially teenagers, are going to do the exact opposite of what you tell them. By literally naming a forest forbidden, you're making it all the more mysterious to students and practically daring them to go in. If it's not the thrill of breaking rules, compelling students into the forbidden forest, descriptions of monsters and grisly deaths might tempt them even more. We can all remember times as kids when we were told not to do something. The consequences were even listed out in most cases, and yet we still had to push boundaries. Telling a group of adults to avoid an area usually works, but this is a castle full of children. Still early in their emotional development, and often lacking common sense, kids are going to make bad choices. In fact, many will relish getting into trouble. It's a wonder more children aren't injured or even killed going into the woods. My own school had a forest around it, and while we were allowed to play in it, there was a cutoff. There were areas we weren't supposed to enter. While I was one of those rare Hermione types who followed the rules, I certainly witnessed other children going where they shouldn't. Every year would probably see groups of kids sneaking into the woods. Some, smuggling butter beer beneath their jackets, might even enter the Forbidden Forest weekly. When Hogwarts receives a group like the Marauders or the Weasley Twins, such excursions also become more likely. If planting a school beside a scary forest and then telling kids don't isn't bad enough, there's the fact Hogwarts will send children into the forest on purpose. Granted, students are accompanied by Hagrid, but even sans Voldemort, the forest is forbidden for a reason. Centaurs, well now creatures of dark magic, might be a student for trespassing on their land. They wouldn't kill anyone, but they could, in their anger, do some damage. Then, of course, you have Aragog and his family. As seen in the second book, we know Aragog isn't above eating students, even if they do claim friendship with Hagrid. While the spiders might not bother students who are with Hagrid in person, it's worth noting that large enough groups are separated. 
While Neville and Hermione serve detention with Hagrid, Harry and Malfoy are sent off in the trees alone. Fang comes, but even Hagrid admits the dog is a coward. It's not clear what would have prevented Harry, Malfoy, and the dog from being carried off by Aragog spiders. It's mentioned that students in trouble can send up red sparks, but that's assuming your wand hasn't been knocked out of your hand, and that Hagrid could outrun the spiders or something equally deadly as it carries you back to its lair. Finally, there's the issue of the unicorns. Something clearly evil was in the woods destroying them and drinking their blood. Who thought it was a good idea to send 11-year-old children to investigate that? If your cattle was ravaged and eaten by something unknown, would you send your kids out at night to look for it? We wouldn't have the exciting plot we have if Hogwarts wasn't sending its kids into mortal peril. But still, it's pretty messed up when you think about it. If Mr. Malfoy had wanted to write a letter of complaint to the school for this one, I don't think I could have blamed him. After all, they might as well have carried Malfoy in on a silver platter with an apple between his teeth. Reason number two on this list is potions class. Potions class always sounded like the class I would have dreaded as a kid, even if Snape hadn't been teaching it. If I'd received my letter, potions would have been up there with math. It doesn't help that this is the class most frequently dragged into two blocks. Moreover, the Gryffindors are often shoved together with the Slytherins, compounding the misery. If that wasn't bad enough, though, you have the potions themselves. Potions can be dangerous, and that you might splash boiling liquid into your eyes or burn yourself. But in those regards, it isn't necessarily more dangerous than home economics. What makes potions truly risky, especially to a band of immature teenagers, is the actual bruise the students are making. While not all potions are deadly, older students might be required to create draughts of living death. One would expect Owl or Newt students to behave themselves, but these are still teenagers. There has to have been at least one instance of a student daring another to take a sip. If you had someone like Tom Riddle in your year, other problems could arise. Would it be that difficult for someone creepy to smuggle a little out in a vial, to be poured into someone's pumpkin juice later? Even if teachers were guarding the students carefully to assure nobody took any of the potion with them, there's still the fact the school is teaching kids how to make a literal poison. There's no way somebody isn't going to misuse that information. We know from the books that students can make potions in secret if they put their minds to it. In the second book, Harry, Ron, and Hermione brew Polyjuice Potion in the abandoned girls' washroom. In the sixth book, several girls also find ways to mix love potions without being caught. Given it seems fairly simple to cook up mixtures in secret, something like a draught of living death would be doable, especially with kids being given access to the recipe and ingredients list. Polyjuice Potion is one of the most complicated potions there is. If kids can make that in secret, they could make anything. We've only discussed the implications of one potion too. Undoubtedly, there are more which could endanger students in other ways. Reason number three on this list is Quidditch. When we think of the reasons for attending Hogwarts, Quidditch has to be one of the few which first springs to mind. Fostering friendships, teaching students coordination and cooperation, and giving those like Harry a hobby, Quidditch is a mostly positive experience for students. Even when students come away with bloody noses and broken bones, the hospital wing is ready to cure those ills. That said, Quidditch is a dangerous game. The largest risk a student faces is falling from a great height. Now, there is evidence to both support and negate this being a serious concern. In the third novel, Harry does fall off his broom as a result of being targeted by Dementors. However, before he can hit the ground at full force, Dumbledore saves his life with a spell which drastically slows the fall. On the other hand, Quirrell and Voldemort through him seems to think he has a good chance of killing Harry with a fall. When he uses dark magic to make Harry's broom buck, the implication is clear. If Harry falls, 
he'll be in trouble. Snape desperately fights Quirrell's spell with his own counter curse, and several of the teachers look concerned. Dumbledore often attends Quidditch matches, so one would assume he'd always be ready to use a resto momentum, but perhaps there is a catch. If the fall happens too quickly, Dumbledore might not be able to use this ability quick enough. Moreover, if two students fell at once, could he catch them both? In the first book, Harry is closer to the ground than in the third. If he was too close, but still high enough up not to escape injury, it's possible the spell couldn't be performed in time. Voldemort isn't an idiot. He grew up at Hogwarts, likely attending Quidditch matches of his own. With his track record, we can assume he knows what he's doing. And yet it's something that could happen to any student. In fact, it does happen. When the Slytherins knock Oliver out, he tumbles to the ground and nobody slows his fall. It may be that wizards are just more resilient to fall damage. Neville fell out of a window when he was eight, but was spared from fatal injury by an innate ability to bounce. Still, we've seen plenty of instances where wizards fell and didn't bounce. It seems like a big risk to take. Eventually, you're going to end up with a student with injuries so severe, even Madame Pomfrey can't help them. If a student doesn't die of a bleeding brain, bad enough concussion could cause everything from amnesia to coma. It would be rare, but still, Quidditch is played all the time, and even professionals sustain some pretty rough injuries. Even if the game shouldn't be banned, more safeguards, like helmets and nets to catch those who fall, could be put in place. Madame Pomfrey is likely exasperated by the continuous patience she does receive because of the sport. Number four on this list are secret rooms. Most of Hogwarts' secret passages are safe, but there are other secrets within the castle's depths. We can't do a video on Hogwarts' bad safety standards without talking about Fluffy. Sure, students are warned away from the third floor corridor. Again though, it's the same as with the forest. If you tell students not to do something, some of them are going to do it. As evidenced by Harry stumbling on the corridor, students might just as easily end up in the corridor by accident. More protections should have been placed around the area. The door to Fluffy's room shouldn't have been able to open through Alohomora. Instead, a special key should have been required to open the door. A key Dumbledore could have kept on his person. That a first year can break into Fluffy's chamber with a basic spell makes one wonder why the stone wasn't stolen sooner. Then there are the traps to reach the stone. Though they were designed with greedy adults in mind, the traps don't distinguish between Death Eaters or kids, and other students, if they weren't gnashed to pieces by Fluffy, could have been choked out by the Devil's Snare in trying to flee the dog. After all, if three man-eating heads were hanging over you, would you hesitate to fling yourself through a trap door if it was available? Ideally, Fluffy will cover the door and scare intruders out, but the dog really will eat you if you don't dash out fast enough. Even when you're out of the room, its heads will pursue you with jaws snapping. Hogwarts is the safest place in Britain, if not the entirety of the wizarding world, to hide something. It's understandable Dumbledore would choose to house the stone there, but more protections of a decidedly less deadly sort should have been placed outside Fluffy's room to prevent students from entering the corridor at all. Reason number five on this list is the Chamber of Secrets. To be fair, most assumed the chamber was a myth. They thought the monster which accompanied such a story was also a legend. But there's a problem with this logic. Despite the belief of most teachers that the chamber isn't real, it's been opened before. During his time at school, Tom Riddle opened the Chamber of Secrets and set the basilisk on his fellow students. During this dark time, a student, Myrtle Warren, who would later become Moaning Myrtle, was killed. Though the attack stopped following Myrtle's death, serious investigations were stopped. McGonagall mentions in the second book that searches have been made of the school, yielding no results. 
However, while there isn't physical proof of the chamber to begin with, there was proof in the form of students being petrified and Myrtle dying. The fact the school wasn't closed until the cause of such tragedies was solved seems in itself irresponsible. While many of the teachers there during Harry's time weren't around during Riddle's years, there were enough who were. Dumbledore and Slughorn would have recalled the chamber opening. They would have known there was a possibility it might open again, and yet none of the teachers seemed prepared to take the danger seriously. If a deadly snake had killed someone in your house, you probably wouldn't settle in again until you'd caught it. Even if you didn't know it was a snake, you'd want to know the space was safe. Until you had deduced why somebody died, you could never be sure you were safe in your own bed. And perhaps students should have been sent home at the first sign the attacks were starting up again. On seeing students being petrified, as they'd been 50 years ago, Dumbledore still chose to let students remain. Given the pattern of the attacks and the threat they present, Hogwarts Castle could give the town of Derry, Maine a run for its money. That's not a good look for your school. Number six on this list is the Triwizard Tournament. It had to be said. In all fairness, the tournament isn't exclusive to Hogwarts. It might just as soon have been held at another school. However, as Hogwarts always competed in it, at least one student from Hogwarts could be endangered by the tasks. In organizing the event in the fourth book, teachers even acknowledge that students have died in the past. Despite this checkered history, all of them believe the tournament is still a worthwhile risk. They place an age limit on students, ensuring that only the most experienced can compete. But this solution seems imperfect. For one, the Goblet of Fire is supposed to choose the names. This doesn't seem to be entirely random either, as the choosing of those like Crumb indicates the cup is looking for someone with the potential to hold their own. In other words, the cup seems to feel the names out, sensing which of those candidates would be best suited to the tasks. This is just my conjecture, but it doesn't seem to spit out names without consideration. Otherwise, you'd end up with more incompetent champions, even among older students. There are enough newt level students who are terrible at spell work and who would fail at defending themselves. All of the students picked by the cup show some level of competence, which indicates the cup checks for this. As such, even if the cup did choose a younger student, it would likely pick someone with some skill. There are students like Harry who can learn to perform incredible magic at an early age. Therefore, taking into account that you have brilliant fourth years and hopeless seventh years, this rule doesn't feel infallible. There's an indication that tasks have been toned down, but they seem plenty dangerous to me. There's literally nothing more deadly than a massive dragon breathing fire at you. Even a talented student, on making a mistake, could be killed in such an instant. The second and third tasks are no exception. Skill isn't going to save someone from drowning if they're at the bottom of the lake when something goes wrong. And if they are at the bottom of a lake, how can teachers properly supervise their safety? Then there's the third task, the maze. Those who have read the books know the task was that much more dangerous. There was no being whisked away by bushes. Instead, students had to face a multitude of traps and deadly creatures. Harry was nearly eaten by a sphinx, burned to death by a blast-ended scroot, and had his leg damaged by a giant spider. These are just the creatures Harry encountered too. There's no telling what the other students might have faced. Even without Voldemort's interference, the tasks could have resulted in student deaths, and yet everyone, including teachers and parents, seemed prepared to take the risk. The intention behind the tournament was positive, as the organizers hoped to unite those of different backgrounds and beliefs, but surely there was a better way to achieve this goal. A Quidditch tournament between schools could have been incredibly exciting. The Hogwarts team could have been a mixture of the best from each of the four house teams. Conversely, Quidditch matches could have continued as normal. The house which won against the others 
could have then been selected to compete with the other schools. I don't know about you, but that would have been not only safer and just as fun, but likely more cost effective too. Plus, Magical Beasts wouldn't have had to be endangered in the process. Coming in at number 7 on this list is The Whomping Willow. Spoiler alert for those fans who have only watched the films, but the tree actually was planted with a purpose. While Remus Lupin was attending Hogwarts as a student, he suffered from lycanthropy. As such, accommodations had to be made for him when he transformed into a werewolf every full moon. During each full moon, Remus was taken to the Shrieking Shack. Students could hear the howling, and from there the rumors about the shack being haunted began. As nobody knew what the sounds actually were, they were attributed to ghosts, and in general people became afraid to venture into the shack. However, the shack had another entrance, a secret one, which could be accessed via the Hogwarts grounds. The Whomping Willow was planted over this entrance, so that students wouldn't sneak into it and consequently become werewolf food on reaching its end. Ironically, the Whomping Willow was planted to keep students safe, but with Lupin's graduation, it became redundant. It's possible Dumbledore protected it as a symbol of the school. On a practical note, he may even have avoided cutting the tree down in case another young werewolf needed it. Lupin might not have been the first, nor the last, lycanthrope to attend the school. Whatever the reasoning, the tree is dangerous. It's too easy to imagine students daring each other to run as close to it as they can. It's not likely students would crash a flying car into the tree, as Harry and Ron managed to do, but certainly there's the risk of somebody smashing into the deadly plant via a broom. Unguided by its owner, Harry's broomstick did manage to doom itself when it collided with the tree. If Harry had been on the broom when it lost control of itself, there's no telling what could have happened. The tree could be potentially dangerous to not only students, but owls too. Wizarding owls are typically pretty smart, but senile ones like the Weasley's own Errol are a different story. It's a wonder the confused Errol didn't crash into the tree, given his penchant for crashing into everything else. In conclusion, the wizarding world itself can be pretty dangerous, with witches and wizards tackling everything from dragons to curses in their daily lives. But it's worth noting that Hogwarts seems even more dangerous than working for the Ministry. Those witches and wizards who don't sign on with the Ministry could expect to lead fairly safe lives. At the very least, they won't go looking for creatures that might eat them, or making potions which would be dangerous to drink. Even within the Ministry, most of the positions are safe enough. Mr. Weasley might be bitten by a kettle, but it would be rare for him, in his department, to encounter something deadly. That's not to say Mr. Weasley couldn't be in danger in his work, but he is an adult, with colleagues to assist him, and it's his job. There's a difference between experienced adults signing up for danger and children being thrust into it. Obviously, students have to be prepared for the dangers of the wizarding world. And even muggle schools aren't without minimal risk if they're doing their job. Kids shouldn't be kept in glass bubbles. That said, some of the dangers children are faced with at Hogwarts seem unnecessary and excessive. No class or punishment should come with a risk of death attached. Moreover, with children and teenagers being especially prone to risk-taking behavior, some of what they're exposed to almost comes across as carelessness on the part of the teachers. Hogwarts might be mystical, wonderful, and fun, yet it's also hazardous for your health. And on examining the dangers it presents, we might just be relieved, after all, that we never got our acceptance letters. Which of the school's dangers shocks you? While reading the books, were there any instances where you found the danger unrealistic? Are there others I've missed on this list? Share your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. Thank you for watching and happy reading.